Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 182, Self-Publishing and Greek Gods, an interview with Kim Thurlow, coming to you on Thursday, February 20th, 2020. I told myself not to say this because... <laughs> Probably no one's as nerdy as me when it comes to numbers who's listening to a writing podcast, but did you realize today is 0220-2020? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's weird. I can't help myself. <laughs> I also noticed this other, yeah, you don't want to know, but I noticed these weird number things and I just had to say it. So to get back to writing, I... <laughs> uh, Kim and I just recently met online, so today was the first time we got to see each other face-to-face -face and really chat. She and I are both going to Mark Dawson's self-publishing show live event next month in London, and so we got to talking on the Facebook group, and I asked her if she had time to do an interview before we meet each other because her work sounded really interesting, and you guys want to know more about more different kinds of authors. I think this might be one of the first times, or at least in at least a year, that I've really talked mostly about the process of self-publishing and what needs to be done and what people, um, what an individual has chosen to do and how they've chosen to do it. And Kim is at the perfect point in her career to be a great guest on the show so she can explain a lot of things to you if you haven't done it or you don't even really know much about self-publishing yet. She has just six Six weeks ago, quit her day job so that she can do this full time. And she's got a plan. And she tells us how she first started, the information that she found for free first as she was writing, more information that she then paid for, more information that she found, and how she kept progressing one step after another. It actually sounds very um, realistic the way that she did it. And I think she's got a lot of really great tips and advice for you. Also, if you're already publishing and this isn't necessarily something that you feel you need more information on, um, at least go and watch the YouTube portion of the of the show for the first couple of minutes. Her puppy is on her lap, which is so cute. And also um, there may be some things that she mentioned that she mentions regarding advertising or switching out covers that you may find to be uh, something that's a good time for you to rethink it. Um, I'm definitely at a place where I'm trying to think, is there anything that I've got that needs a new cover, a new description, that sort of thing. So it's a really great conversation. We have a lot of fun and there's going to be a lot of great links in the show notes because she mentions several things especially wait for the one at the end where I get so excited. <laughs> she mentioned several things that I think will be very helpful. So I hope you enjoy the show. Here's Kim. Today's guest is Kim Thurlow. Kim is a full-time self-published author and book cover designer. She writes fantasy under the pen name Eliza Rain and currently has six books published in two series. All of her work is based on Greek mythology with a series for younger teens, think Percy Jackson, and one for adults, more traditional fantasy. She lives with her husband, three exceptionally needy and fluffy cats, and a hyperactive puppy near Reading in the south of England. Welcome, Kim. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's so good. We just met online, really. So you and I and all the listeners will get to know each other all at the same time. <laughs> Oh, and for anybody who's watching on YouTube, or actually for, for anyone who's not watching, if you're just listening, the most cute puppy in the world is sitting on Kim's lap. <laughs> you might look at the screen now. Hey, baby. <laughs> yeah, I can't get rid of him. He's my writing pal. <laughs> Aw. What's his name? His name's Bailey. Bailey. Nice. Yeah. Hey, Bailey. Oh, I just realized hey, you can't hear me because we've got our yeah, earbuds in. <laughs> Something way more interesting than a computer is outside the window. <laughs> yeah, lots of other dogs. <laughs> Aw, nice. Well, listen, so hopefully we won't interrupt Bailey's uh, staring out the window at other dogs as we have our conversation. But I thought, let's just start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about like how you first got started writing stories. Uh, okay, sure. I think I've always written stories. I used to tell my little brother stories when we were like sub 10. Um, nice. And then I wrote fantasy stories the whole way through my teens. I don't think anything really good, but I always loved to write. Um, 
And then as I got older, I started to write a bit more seriously. I started to pay attention to craft and read about how, how to write. Um, and then I had an idea for a series. I've always been obsessed with Greek mythology. It's just, it's fascinating and crazy and just endless inspiration. Um, and I had an idea about writing the 12 Trials of Hercules with Hercules as a bad guy instead of as a good guy. Because the more I read, the more I thought, this guy's actually a bit of a bully. He seems a bit, I'm not sure why he's a hero sometimes. <laughs> uh, and the more I thought about it, the more I really wanted to do it. And I, uh, I had an ending for the series. And that was the first time I'd ever known how a whole series would end before I'd even written a single word. Um, so my husband said to me, well, why don't you do it then? Let's go for it. Let's do it for real. Um, I was an analytics consultant working in London, so I had quite a good job at the time. And we uh, dropped—I dropped my working days down to four days a week and spent one day a week, basically, for most of a year writing the first book in that series. And I also started to save some money as well because I'd heard about self-publishing. And at the time, I didn't—I'd submitted uh, romantic comedy books to publishers before, but never any of my fantasy work. And it's even turned down for me. Um, but I knew that there was a lot more self-control with self-publishing. And I knew that I'm a very impatient person, naturally. And I knew that you could move much faster with self-publishing. So I, writ- I wrote the series from the outset with the intention of self-publishing. Um, so, yeah, I began saving at that point in case at any point I did want to self-publish. Because I knew I'd have to pay for editors and covers and stuff. Um... And then I did, I spent uh, quite a lot of money, actually. I think I spent around $600-ish sending the first section of the book and then the whole, a detailed outline for the whole series to a developmental editor. And she was amazing. She got this huge report back and it was basically like an intensive writing class. Wow. (laughs) She pointed out so many things. Probably the most useful thing she pointed out to me was um, when it comes to uh, like information dump to work out if you're doing too much info dumping have a look at the amount of times you use the word had because we only really use the word had if we're talking retrospectively which when you're writing in the third person yeah sort of signifies info dump and she pointed out that like in a 30,000 word chunk I'd written the word had about 300 times it was making up like a four percent of my manuscript <laughs> Oh no! At that point, so you're definitely doing too much info dump. Have a look at that. But yeah, it was it was amazingly helpful. A little bit difficult to read the first time because I was like, oh my god, I need to start again. <laughs> yeah. When you get past that bit, I was like, no, this is amazing. And um, yeah, she really helped me refine it, helped me spot like because she went through the outline for the series as well. It gave me loads of confidence to then keep going with that. Um, so then after that, I dropped my working days down to three days a week and started writing the rest of the series, um, still saving up for when I was going to publish, uh, found a cover designer. And then I found Mark Dawson's self-publishing 101 course. Um, so I bought that, uh, started reading up about that and I realized that there was going to be quite a lot of admin involved if I was going to do it for real. Yeah. So I took one of my uh, romantic comedy books that had been turned down <laughs> and did a kind of test publish with it under a pen name, um, which was quite useful because I discovered that setting up uh, a limited company in the UK is an absolute pain. It took ages, so I was really glad that I got all that out of the way before I published my proper series. Yeah. Um, I ended up learning all about the software that I needed, so like Vellum for formatting books and Book Funnel for delivering books to folks on Kindle and all sorts of other bits and bobs. So basically, it was like a really, really good practice run. So when it came to releasing the first book in my Hercules series, I really did feel quite prepared for it and had everything set up and in place and had started to stalk a lot of the Facebook groups as well. Yeah. <laughs> like the self publishing formula community and. Um, the 20 books to 50k groups and stuff like that so i'd start to get a little bit familiar with start listening to a lot of podcasts absolutely love audio and podcasts um then when i launched that first book i took a three-month sabbatical from work wow um and i have an extremely supportive husband uh he's super super good at uh, <laughs> making me be patient and helping me work out what we can and can't kind of afford to do 
stuff so yeah it was really good um and that was really really useful because it allowed me to set up my website get everything launched get most of the second book written um uh, but mostly it proved to me that i could sit by myself all day every day for 12 weeks and get on with it not just yeah. start putting up stuff which i wasn't completely sure i'd be able to do because i'd always still been working more than half of the week in my old job yeah um so yeah that was great um then, yeah, then I started publishing the series. And by the fifth book, I think my advertising was starting to pay for itself, which was great. I'd had uh, my audio books made, uh, the first three, and loved that. I got a huge, huge kick from that. Um, and then, I don't know how much you follow the fantasy genre, but Academy Books uh, took off in quite a big way last year. And I've always loved the Percy Jackson books. I don't know if anyone who's not familiar with Harry Potter with Greek mythology. Right. Really, really popular. Aimed at like 15, 16 year olds, mostly like younger teens. And I was like, oh, this could fit in really well. I've always wanted to write books like that. Um, so I wrote uh, that. I wrote that very quickly. It's the first time I tried to write that quickly. Um, but that series did quite well. Um, just releasing the last book in that series next month. Um, yeah, so by the end of the year, I was finally getting uh, positive returns on all my books. So I quit my job. <laughs> wow. Um, so, and I've been full-time since January. I'm not, I'm still not making, well, I'm not making even a fraction of what I was in my old job. As I say, supportive husband, he works in finance, so I'm uh, surrounded by spreadsheets. And um, <laughs> I think one of the main things for me was that I'd saved up enough to launch the business and I knew when I left my job I've got enough to cover me for another six books being released and that's to cover editors and covers for some stuff I can do my own covers but I'm not very good at fantasy covers so um oh yeah there's other things so last year I also started to make uh and sell book covers as well uh, which helps cover the cost of my covers <laughs> <laughs> um so you're not doing your yeah. own covers I have done the covers. I've just, so I've just recovered my Hercules series. The last book came out last month. And um, my old covers, I love them. I absolutely love them. Um, but they look too urban fantasy for the series. The series is a lot more high fantasy, I guess. Um, right. So I don't think it was hitting quite the right genre. So I have made the ones that are on these now, which is a little bit nerve-wracking. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but no, I mostly make covers for, I have Kim's Cozy covers. I do... Um, crazy mystery vector style covers um and some romantic comedy and that kind of thing nice now um i have to ask as a romantic comedy reader and writer are your romantic comedies still for sale no i took it down i took it down not long after i published it was a bit waffly uh, it wasn't i'd written it quite a long time ago and it was mostly just kind of silly anecdotal stuff i picked up over over time there wasn't really much of a plot to it one thing that publishing that did do was it meant that I got my first fan reviews out of the way before I published the series I really loved. So, <laughs> so that was quite good to get. Out of the way. Nice. Um, so no, no, that book is completely dead. I told nobody, not even my mum, that I'd released. <laughs> it was purely a test, and, yeah. uh, and that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh my goodness. Okay, so. Right now, it looks like you're you're firmly in the mythology um, genre, one way or the other, whether it's adult or teen. Yeah, and that's um, mostly just because you love it. And do I remember from um, I read a couple different bios? I think the one on Amazon might have said that you were a history major. Yeah, that's right. I did a degree in history. Yeah, I um, I wanted to do classics, but it would have meant moving to uh, Scotland. That was the only place I could get a place on a agree and I was unwilling to move that far but I still sometimes I think I should have because I love classics. <laughs> nice and so um you said that one of the series uh and I'm sorry that I don't know which one is which one of the series okay. just ended is that the teen series no that was the Hercules series Here, yeah. okay yeah and from a publishing and marketing perspective I've seen a huge increase in uh, people interested in it now that the last book came out Huh? which I was always hoping would be the case um, and I've been quite pleased to see that it has been. I think yeah. a lot of readers like complete series in fantasy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've heard that too. And I've also talked to people who have um, been telling me about their favorite fantasy series. And they're like, you know, the the year, a year and a half that you have to wait between books just about kills you. And sometimes uh, I, I have met not very many, uh, but a few people who won't even start book one until they know the series no. is finished. And I'm yeah, like, I've... how can you keep First of all, how can you keep yourself from reading a great book? But also, like, I will never remember that five years from now. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So, so your your journey has always been um, to self publish. The traditional road just wasn't uh, something that you were interested in. No, I was originally years ago when I first I used to follow Joanna Penn um, loads when I first started out like writing properly when I was, I don't know, probably eight or nine years ago. And um and it looked like you had to have a really strong social media presence. And at the time I just wasn't really very interested in that. I would write under a pen name. I've never really wanted to be that kind of not an introvert, I wouldn't say, but it, it was still looked like a lot more of you required than I was willing to give. Yeah. Um, but then when I went through Mark Dawson's course, uh, I realised that, that you can definitely strike a balance. And actually, as it's ended up, um, it's such a solitary kind of job that the social media side of it is nowhere near as unpleasant or time-consuming or personality sapping as I thought it would be. I've actually made some really great author friends who I chat to loads and met oh. people like yourself. Um, <laughs> and like, actually, it's a really, really incredible community of people. Yeah. Um, and I love hearing from readers on Facebook. I absolutely love it. I get messages, not loads, but enough that uh, I really like it. Um, because I've just released the last in the series, I've actually got quite a lot of messages in the last few weeks, and it just it makes it all worth it. I write in the, in the UK, but I um, advertise primarily in the US, and if most of my readership is in the US, and it still just blows my mind that somebody on the other side of the planet has taken the time to send me a message to say they're like something I made up. I just, yeah. it still blows my mind. I absolutely love it. <laughs> I totally get what you mean. <laughs> oh man. All right. So, um, I had a thought, but your stories are so interesting. I just like talking to you. That was what I was going to say, actually. <laughs> so <laughs> you're sitting in a room by yourself. I'm sitting in a room by myself. It can be really hard, even as a, as a yeah. professional podcaster to be like, I'm focused. I know what I'm going to say. I've got my notes here because I'm like, oh my gosh, me too. Oh, let's talk about this. I'm like, okay, focus, kitty. <laughs> but one of the great things, and there are times too when I'm just like, okay, too much social media. I just, um, I just like really want to be by myself, even within my own head, uh, you know, because it's, you are still by yourself as you're typing, but yeah. sometimes I, I just don't even want to do that. But then other times, so you and I are getting ready to go to the same event, which is how we actually met because there was a group page for the uh, self-publishing show first live event hosted by Mark Dawson and his whole team. So I have to say yeah. James Fletch too, because <laughs> he's a huge part <laughs> of the team. But then you have to mention all the other team members and I'm like, okay, stop. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> no, I actually, I was actually on the same history course as Tom on the SPF team. Really? Yeah. Fun. There you go. In Portsmouth University. <laughs> yeah. Small <laughs> world. Right, exactly. And that's the best part is that it is a small enough world that like there's um well, there I think there's gonna be about close to a thousand people who are showing up for this event. And there's already probably at least a couple hundred people that I'm aware of who are like, oh, let's, everybody who writes in this genre, let's get together. And then yeah. people are talking to each other and, you know, whatever. And then I said, hey, is anybody want to be on my podcast? And then somebody else said, oh, I'm a podcaster too. All the podcasters should get together. <laughs> and I'm like, this is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? So do you do anything else that's with other people or do you miss that aspect of your old day job? You know, the, the being with people or part? Um, sometimes I miss the kind of, uh, I think my husband gets fed up with me just going on and on about, I changed this Facebook ad to be five pounds a day instead of six pounds. <laughs> There's sort of no one to really kind of vent at. Um, so I think, yeah, some of my friends and family probably wish I went to an office every now and again, but they do have in the UK and I don't know if it's the same in the US, but you can, uh, cause there are so many independent freelancers now making 
money, like online business has revolutionised the way the economy works here. Um, and there are lots of places where you can rent desk space for a couple hours a week and you pay by the hour. And it's all aimed at like, independent people. So um, they have things like a Christmas party and a summer ball or like, those kind of social events through work where you interact with people you wouldn't normally. Um, so one of the first things I'm going to do when I start paying myself a salary, which I'm hoping for by next year, um, will be looking at budgeting in for that. Because I think um, I think that would be just a few hours a week and to chat to other folk working for themselves would be really, really cool. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. I um I've thought about it. I've seen a lot of places like when I lived in LA, I saw a couple of different places, several, um, several places like that. I think when I lived in Australia or New Zealand, there's at least one time where it came to mind. I know of a couple of places here in Malmo, Sweden. And sometimes I think, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And then I think, no, I can get far more work done at home, but maybe it would be good for my husband's sanity for me to not like <laughs> throw myself at him when he comes in the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that he has like summer parties and Christmas parties and that's when I, I get know. jealous. I can't go to his Christmas party and I'm like, oh. exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I never thought I should look for a place that has stuff like that. Like, okay, part of the reason why John and I were like, yes, we should definitely, um, we should definitely, I say we, I say we about everything because he and I Me make decisions together. Yeah. Yeah. But exactly also, the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But also sometimes I forget that I shouldn't say we about his job. <laughs> but when he was considering and we were discussing whether we should move to Sweden, um, we jokingly said, well, there's two excellent reasons. Why would you not want to move a country, move to a country that has national waffle day and national cinnamon bun day? Uh, that is that is two very very good reasons right yeah <laughs> and one of them is the day after my birthday and one of them is a couple of days after john's birthday and we're like it's a sign from god <laughs> <laughs> but i should look i should look for one of those creative uh share spaces that actually does social stuff like that like a christmas party because that's the part where i'm just like i should just go yeah. get a job <laughs> that's, yeah i think that's the only time i miss it yeah, yeah. Though I will say that, um, blah, 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 long story, but for listeners who've been listening for a long time, um, I went through a period of really bad burnout about a year and a half ago. And um, there was a point at which I was just like, I, I need to do something to just help my, my mind to heal from all the stress that we've been under for the last several years. Um, and I ended up getting a job at the same company that he works at, and it's a video game company. So it was oh, like fun. it was like one hundred percent or ninety nine percent creative people, and I was like, "This is the best job ever." <laughs> oh, <cool. laughs> and the one thing that I missed uh, when my contract came from an, to an end was just like saying good morning to people and yeah, having tea together and yeah. I find I go to like the hairdresser and end up telling them my life story and they're like, yes. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know your name, but I know yeah. about you now. <laughs> yeah. My dentist has seen all my books. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's too bad. You can't tell your dentist more about them, you know, cause your mom. Know. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> to qualify, I have only been full time in this job since January, but my last job was a consultant and all my customers were remote. So I've been working at home by myself for much longer oh. than since January. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. I haven't like had all this. I've been in the last six weeks. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, congratulations on your move over the last six weeks. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to be, so for people listening who are um, looking for an opportunity to move from a full-time position to uh, full-time writing. Um, what are some things that I'm just going to mention a few things that you've already said, and maybe you can expand on them as tips for mm -hmm. listeners. Um, you talked about um, saving, planning ahead, mm -hmm. your husband's spreadsheets, um, and mm -hmm. that you had already, you just now told us you'd already been doing some of your full-time job work at home actually. So what are some of the things that you think would be helpful for other people as they're making their plan, their plan to transition? 
I think, yeah, so saving was definitely, definitely a big one for me. Um, I had already got the course, um, the 101 course, so I had a rough idea and I've been spending enough time on the groups to know that an editor costs this much, a cover costs this much, um, and that I'd need some software to get going. Um, so stuff like uh, Vellum, which uh, is used to format ebooks. If you're going to make lots of books, then it's a good upfront cost. If not, it's not. Um, also, because I'm such a huge audiobook fan, uh, I knew right at the outset how much I wanted audiobooks. But I also knew as a brand new author that royalty share would be really difficult. So I uh, made sure I had a big pot of cash to get the first set of audiobooks out. Um, so you went so, ahead and paid the audiobook narrator? Yes. Rather I than did. doing a royalty um, share. Okay. Yeah, on the first one. <laughs> I uh, I fell in love with a particular narrator who'd done an extremely successful series, so I knew she wouldn't be the cheapest. Um, but she was able to drop the price to something I could afford, um, and she's now recording the last book for my academy series. For my younger series, I used a different narrator. I used a newer, um, cheaper narrator. She's lovely, unbelievably professional, really really quick, fantastic quality work. And the books have been really, really, really well received. So it, from my experience, the quality of the narrator, as long as they're a good narrator, the price uh, can be down to sort of what they, what's in their catalogue. But I do know that my first narrator, Elizabeth Evans, um, I've had so many people tell me they only got the books because she narrated it and they follow everything she does because she's so well established. Um, so it was definitely worth it for me. And from a, from a vanity point of view... <laughs> <laughs> at the time I could afford it and she's my favorite narrator so to hear her reading my books was like the biggest kick of all of this for me so I absolutely loved it yeah um so definitely worth the cost for me um and now I think I probably could go out for royalty share um if I wanted to but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my model very much pay for production and own everything yeah um there are definitely well. advantages yes. to to owning it because then you can make, for instance, yeah. um, I'm so lucky. My narrator and I actually were friends before we, like long before um, we talked about, hey, maybe we should do this business model together. Um, so I was able to get someone who was professional and fantastic, who loved my work and I loved her work and <laughs> that was great. But um, we're in a position now where we're, five and a half years in, I think, of our seven-year contract with Audible, uh, ACX. And um, there are some things that we would like to do on some of the other uh, distributors, but we can't do it without ending our Audible contract. And then we were like, okay, but before we just tried it, because you can uh, write you letters. You can email, and try yeah. To, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and um, you need to show that both of you are willing to to get out of the contract but then we still have the the part where well now she's not she's not in royalty share with me once we get out of that contract so you know we have to figure out well yeah yeah um my thought is that probably we should just come to agreement where i i buy out well my thought is because she's a friend of mine and i don't want to take advantage of her in any way my thought is, is that i should and want to save up enough money to pay her uh, the balance of what she would have charged me if, if I would just been, you know, paying her outright. So if yeah. it was $3,000 and she's made $1,000, I would just pay her $2,000 and then, because I, I want her to also feel like she's, you know, got a good deal. But there's a, yeah, all these other sure. things then that we, we can't do together because of the um, royalty share with Audible. You have talked a lot about ACX and Audible and your experience there on other forums. Do you want to add some of your experiences, particularly anything that could be helpful advice for listeners? I think um, I see a lot of questions in a lot of the groups and people looking to get into audio because obviously it's a growing market. and. Um, a good place to be right now um and i think my experience i think i usually offer <laughs> my thoughts just because i've tried like both ways with the with an established more expensive narrator and a, a newer narrator so the first time i directly approached a specific narrator through acx and the second time i listed my work for audition and i got lots of auditions i think because academy was a big genre at the time so it was uh 
it's somewhere to sort of be. And I set my budget at the lowest end you can set your budget, which is 50 to to $100 per finished hour. Whereas my first book um, was well over 200 uh, per finished hour. My first series, sorry, with, with Elizabeth. Um, and uh, I think ACX as a platform for, for uh, managing the relationship between a producer, narrator and an author is fantastic. Though Their guides are really, really clear. The process is really, really structured. Everything is all there legally covered. You don't have to do or worry about anything, really. It's all managed really, really well. Um, so that process is super smooth. Uh, approve everything. She's a narrator, a communicator with narrator. Everyone on there is really polite. I've messaged everybody who auditioned, whether or not I liked the audition, saying thank you for their time and everything. Uh, yeah, really, really great. What I will say about ATX, though, is their reporting is all... I don't know if you find the same thing, but I, I'm an analytics consultant, so I've worked with data my whole life. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it frustrates me so much. They don't even report at a day level. So if you run a five-day advertising campaign, you've got no way. They're reporting delays of three or four days and completely sporadic, and they don't give you a month-end report with days. So you can't. there's no way of measuring the effectiveness of right. promotional efforts, which is very frustrating. Um, and they don't tell you what one sale is worth either because there are so many different ways of, an, of a customer buying a book, whether it's through a credit, and even that can be split. So if a customer is on a one credit a month um, plan, you get a different royalty than if they're on a two credit a month plan because they're paying less for each credit or a three credit a month plan, then you've got guys who are buying it for the cost price. Then you've got guys who are getting the whisper sync. So if you pay 99p for the ebook or whatever you pay for the ebook, you can get the audiobook at a cheaper price. Um, and then you've got guys redeeming promotional codes, which ACX give you if you're exclusive with them. Right. And you get a small uh, like kickback from Audible each time someone redeems one of your review promotional codes. What that means is if you get a month, at the end of the month, you've got 150 sales of audiobooks. You've got a vague breakdown. <laughs> uh, they break it into kind of three chunks, but and then just a total. So it, it's very hard. <laughs> I've got lots of spreadsheets that try to guess uh, roughly how much I get per sale. Um, yeah. But it, it, it's, I've given up running adverts on them now. Um, when my ebooks are selling well, my audio sells better too, and that's about as close as I can get. <laughs> So, yeah. You know, I get those reports and I remember being confused by the lack of detail at first. And then after a while, it was just a matter of look at it, download it, save it. Um, but now yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, but I haven't, I hadn't tried running uh, advertisements aimed just at the audio books. So I think that would have been when I realized, wait, yeah, a minute, well, not enough information. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. You can watch your rank on Amazon. The audio book has its own rank and that's about the best uh, way I've found of trying to work it out because I think that is real time. And I see that go up whenever I do big promotional pushes with promo codes and stuff. But Right. Yeah, and that's really on tricky. Author Central? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, or just go to the product page and click on the audiobook, and instead of having their Kindle store rank, it's got an audiobook rank. Ah, good. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you yeah. can attempt to use that. But Facebook does have target interests for podcasts and for audiobooks. So, when I combine that with Greek mythology or a couple of little fantasy books, um, I do get quite a lot of clicks, but so there's no way to see if they're converting. So, oh, right. <laughs> so, I have uh, bailed on that now. Um, yeah, but yeah, for, I mean, from a from it, if anyone is interested, the my my academy series um, has has moved much quicker than my other series, but my other series isn't complete yet. And I think my audio, because whilst I released the last book last month, um, it's not been recorded yet. And I've actually had quite a lot of messages saying, "When's the last book?" I'm audible, <laughs> um, and I'm hoping I'll see the same thing because audiobooks are even bigger investment for somebody to make if the last yeah. book's not out. And I'm sure there are people who do run out of money to have them recorded. And things. So um, I'm hoping um, that I'll see quite a lot more move. And because I own the rights, I can combine the books into box sets to match my e-books if they slow down. 
uh, obviously two books as a longer story and hopefully more appealing. Um, right. So, and I own the I own the book, so I can I can do that. So, right. That's yeah. an advantage as well. Yeah, I was just listening to um, can't remember who. But I listen mostly to Mark Dawson's show and Joanna Penn's show. Uh, so it was probably one of those, which means that it was probably someone from, I don't think it was Audible. I don't think they've had anybody on that I remember. Uh, it could have been somebody from Find Away Voices, but somebody was talking about um, the, oh my gosh, sorry. This is what happens when I work by myself. I like go off on this tangent <laughs> of trying to figure out where did I find this information? And then I'm like, what was my question? <laughs> <laughs> Doggone it. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I was going to ask you, though, I'll, I'll remember what I was going to, where I was going with that thought in a minute, but I was going to ask you, are you with any other distributors like Find Away Voices or? No, so my whole, all my work is on Amazon exclusive. Um, I, I'm comfortable with that at the moment. I get uh, probably 70% of my um, book income is from Kindle Unlimited. Um, and I'm certainly wow. really happy with that. Um, a lot, there's a lot, of a big fantasy readership, I think, in KU and romance. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. And at the moment, I'm pleased to go with Audible because I think they've got the market share. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of, I know some of authors have really strong opinions on wide or exclusive with Amazon. I'm fairly ambivalent. I think Amazon make, make the platform quite easy to use, except Amazon advertising, which is not. Um, <laughs> yeah um, yeah I'm quite happy to uh, to make the most of what they've got there as long as it's uh, working <laughs> so your audiobooks ebooks and print books are all Amazon exclusive uh, I do have print with Ingram Spark as well Excellent, which means that if somebody uh, wants to buy your book at the bookstore they just go to the bookstore and order it yeah yeah okay Excellent. Um, I have to break in with the little kind of aside about the fact that you and I are going to London Book Fair. Are you, wait a minute. Okay. So you and I are going to the SPS Live event, which is the day before London Book Fair. But I was wondering, are you going to London Book Fair and are you going I'm to go not. visit? Okay. Are you going to go visit the Ingram Spark facility? I, uh, last year I went to the London Book Fair and I met, um, I met lots of SPF people there, um, more by accident than by anything else. <laughs> um, but then we ended up just spending most of the afternoon chatting between us and not watching any of the talks. <laughs> um, so then when Mark's team announced that they were going to be doing their own day the day before, I was like, that to me is a better spend of money because that's mostly what I did the next day at the London <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so I am going today. And uh, as previously mentioned, supportive husband, uh, we, he's coming too, which is awesome. He's taking the day off work. Because he now nice. knows probably as much about book marketing as I do. Yeah. And we talk about it. <laughs> um, and we're going to the boat drinks in the evening. Cool. As well. So it'd be really nice to chat to some people. But actually, one of the ladies I met at the London Book Fair last year, so nearly a full year ago now, I speak with weekly. <laughs> wow. We chat all the time about all sorts of stuff that we're doing. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really cool community of people as we were saying oh nice nice well i'm very excited to go to the ingram ingram spark facility and just see all of their state-of-the-art print-on-demand machinery and how it all I works know that would be there that sounds really cool i don't think that um i don't think that it's too late so there's one uh, there they apparently like with everything else with um mark dawson's followers more people were interested than they originally made room for so the friday before um there's some people going i'm going then but then apparently um the person who is organizing it found out there was a whole bunch more people who still wanted to go that couldn't get in on that Friday. So the Friday after a London book fair. So the, the Friday okay. of the week. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll, if you can't find it, let me know and I'll find the thread where, where some yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, putting it together. Basically it's a free event. It's like a half a day and, uh, you get a tour. I think they give you lunch, which uh, presumably is during a Q and a time where you can just talk to them about what are your questions. I'm just really excited about seeing, I, I saw an actual, uh, book production facility that's the traditional way of, of doing book production and it was 
fascinating. And now, like in my mind, I want to see what's the difference, what's the difference in the kinds of equipment and how does it work, um, you know, in doing print on demand and how does my book get from somebody clicks something that doesn't exist until it becomes something that goes in the mail. That just sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, and if people live near, um, so this is outside of London, the Milton Keynes facility. And then um, there's a facility in Melbourne, but I don't remember whether or not I heard that they do or don't have tours. But basically, if you're interested in touring one of these places, um, you should just contact the office of, you know, Ingram or KDP or whatever and find out whether or not the facility that you found out is near you gives tours to the public. So... Great idea. I figure, in my mind, it's just hard to say when all of the bits and bobs of information uh, come together that will be something that I'm so glad that I have that information in my head now. So, and I just like learning new things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, I'm just thinking about anything else that you might be able to uh, offer um, listeners uh, your take on it. So, when you, when you started the writing and then you were like, okay, I've decided I'm going to self-publish. So you were listening to a lot of podcasts. So that's one tip. Listen to people who Definitely. are ahead of you in the game, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And are there Definitely. any that you still listen to? Uh, yep. So I still listen to Joanna Penn and Mark Dawson. I love uh, the Six Figure Author podcast with Lindsay Broker. I used to listen to her science fiction and fantasy one. Um, but they've made it a bit more genre wide. However, they do all write fantasy, so I can help you. <laughs> yeah. In that. Um, I also really like um, more crafts uh, wise. Um, KM Wyland's uh, podcast. Oh, my head's gone completely blank, and I can't remember what it's called. They're quite short; they're about twenty minutes, and they're oh. all about actual writing. Okay. Um, uh, you can send me the link, and I'll put it in the. Yeah, I'll have to. Because they're they're really 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 good. Oh um, wow! They use and, sort of uh, four ways to make your character more convincing, or uh, five ways to make a scene really come to life. That kind of thing. But they're they're great. Nice. Oh, that does sound good. And way shorter than my podcast. I just can't seem to stop talking when I'm with another writer. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> Uh, and then at some point you were like, okay, um, I've gotten as, as far as I can with the free information, but I need some more detailed stuff. So then you um, bought into an online class, right? Yeah. Okay. And that yeah, was... Yeah, so I bought the Mark Dawson class. I bought the 101 and the ads for authors at the same time. Um, probably I got started with the ads a little bit early when I only had one book out. Uh, but if you look at my uh, spreadsheets, my ad spend has come down uh you can see where i was learning <laughs> so i think that would have happened at any point you're gonna you're gonna lose some money when you're learning. And i think uh, again back to my saving up uh yeah <laughs> kind of thing uh, i think it is really important to have have that sort of write that off straight away um, yeah and I heard somebody on one of the interviews recently say uh, she and her husband came up with a dollar amount that they could afford to let go of every month. And she yeah. just used that dollar amount. Even as sales were going up, you don't get paid for 60 days. So yeah. even as they went up, she kept on using the money she actually had. And then she yeah. started. start. Yeah. That is yeah, definitely. When I, um, I obviously, I slowly left my old job out of four days, three days. Three months back school, I started to cancel subscriptions. My husband and I made sure that we uh, were bringing our lifestyle to a place where we could maintain it with me not making anything. And we've tried to budget really carefully on having enough in the bank to support this, my business. And he's really good at reminding me it is a business. Um, I'm, I'm, as I said, impatient and possibly I'd have quit <laughs> if uh, he wasn't constantly comparing what I'm doing to any small startup, it takes two or three years to get going. You need a backlist, you need assets, and you need this, that, and the other. And he's he's very good at making me sort of focus my brain like that. It's yeah. very hard when you're creative. Creativity doesn't tend to go hand in hand with order and patience. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's really funny. useful to have that reminder regularly. Yeah. And I used to be in finance. Um, you were in analytics. I was in finance and accounting for about 15 years. And yet 
when my creative brain is going, it's like I forget everything I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly the same. Yeah. Exactly the same. <laughs> uh, but coming back to the business uh, decision, um, and, and I'm guessing here it's actually, this is a question. Um, you were talking about a backlist being um, part of what helps everything to build. That's kind of what the idea of 20 books to 50K groups are about. Yeah. Um, so did you have a plan? Did you already know that you needed to have books in a series? Uh, or was yeah, that a happy well, accident for you? <laughs> so, <laughs> my ratings go up much, much, much quicker as I've gone on. My books are all pretty much the same length. That's not really changed. But um, I think I'm too impatient for record release. I can't sit on books. I can't do it. And once I'd released my first one, I was like, right, you've got momentum. You've wasted all this money on ads and getting eyes on the books. You may as well just get <laughs> <laughs> um, So my kind of philosophy and what I keep telling myself is that um, if, as long as I am consistent, as long as my work is good quality, as long as readers and my readers know what to expect from me, I'm, I'm going to – I have the luxury of a position where I know I can fund myself for the next – year to 18 months depending on how many book covers I sell as well that does help um and keep producing books so I'm now uh publishing pretty much every other month and as long as I maintain that rate I'm hoping to start making money in 2021 I think it's more realistic to to suggest that I'd be making something closer to what I walked away from um but by then I think at the moment, I'm not losing money, which is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's um, nice that you're already at a break-even point, you're saying. Yeah, well, the audio has really tipped that. Uh, I think ebook I'm about even. It's audio that's tipping me into profit at the moment. Um, so, yeah, no, that is, and it's earlier than I expected it to be, so that's fantastic. Um, but without a runaway breakout success, and I know I, did, I am writing to market, but I'm not. I'm not expecting any of them to take off like that. Um, yeah. But having, if all my readers know that if you want Greek mythology retellings told with lots of action and a fairly heavy amount of romance, <laughs> um, then you're like Eliza Rain's books. Then that's 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 what I'm aiming for. So that that's my my goal is more the twenty books to fifty k, kind of plod up the mountain with consistent hard work. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so long as you just gave us this awesome, like, 10 second um, description of your book, I'm like, I need a 10 second description <laughs> of my books. Uh, tell us what the book one of all your different series are in case people want to, like, hurry up and Google it even before they finish listening. Uh, okay, sure. So, my, my main series, my baby, as it were, uh, is a retelling of the 12 trials of Hercules. So, it's four novels, but each novel is three of the kind of trials of Hercules. Uh, Hercules is a bad guy and the story revolves around his daughter who uh, survived his his rage um, and she's now the captain of a smuggler ship and ships fly in Olympus, my Greek world. Each of the 12 gods has their own realm and each of the gods runs one of these 12 trials and the winner, uh, the winner gets to be immortal. So I include uh, real excerpts from ancient texts throughout all my books because when I first started sending the chapters to some of my American beta readers, a lot of them were like, "Oh, Hercules is a good guy, a, a Disney Hercules." Like we're we're not we're not on board with this. Yeah. Um, so I started to include some of the excerpts because there's lots and lots of real uh, written stuff that's over two thousand years old, and all the stupid stuff Hercules did. It's definitely not heroic. So, yeah, the feedback I've had from, from readers about including those excerpts has been pretty good because then um, people kind of go, oh, I might go and have a look on, on Google about what happened with this or what happened with that. Um, so it's quite fun, funneling people into Greek mythology. <laughs> yeah, I have um, to say, I'm like, wait, you have part of the text in your book? I, now I have to go try it too. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun, but I then lose hours to, like, researching. I'm like, I need the perfect excerpt on Hercules killing a centaur. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm there for hours reading all this weird Latin stuff that's like thousands of years old. <laughs> wow, and yet you probably are not sad that you did it because you probably love no, it, huh? Not that's the fun <laughs> bit. <laughs> also, I try to keep loads of the names. So my book, this series, is written from five different points of view. 
And I've tried to keep a lot of the names Greek characters from the real myths. And some people, um, like, do, do, do you need to use the Greek names? There's quite a lot of them. <laughs> so <laughs> possibly. So my newer series, I've gone a little bit, um, my younger series, I've gone a bit more. Uh, I've got Pandora and Icarus, both Greek uh, figures, but I've, I've stuck a lot more with them. Um, with more well-known names. Also, a really, really lovely reader from Greece uh, emailed me after she read my first book and she uh, offered to help me out with a lot of the words because she was like, a couple of these Greek words you've used, you've not used in quite the right context. Um, and she said to drop her an email whenever I had questions and she's amazing. She now helps me name loads of stuff in my books. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> really lucky. So thanks, Rena. <laughs> um yeah, and then my second series is a uh, retelling of Pandora's box. So it's aimed at, um, it's about uh, Pandora's 16th birthday. She finds out that she's actually descended from Oceanus, the Titan, and gets whisked away to an underwater school where she has to learn how to use all her water magic. And uh, may or may not open a box she's not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lets out some demons that her and uh, Icarus have to to get back in the box nice so okay was, and what uh, what are the what are the titles again uh, the first series the hercules series is called the immortality trials okay and that one's kind of young adult so young adult is they're, they're uh, good thing about high fantasy is you don't really need to say how old anybody is so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um it's uh, there's a little bit of swearing a bit of violence uh, but fairly clean otherwise um and then the second the first book in that series is called skies of olympus and then the uh the younger series for teenagers is, is called olympus academy nice and the best book's called the titan's treasure cool. and they're all available on audible <laughs> yay <laughs> <laughs> now since you've just wrapped up one series are you starting a third series that will also have i am greek mythology yeah, i've got it on pre-order now i'm about to get the third oh. cover through for my cover design this week which is very exciting wow. um and that one is a retelling of hades and persephone nice um, so i'm going to go a lot more romance on this one a bit, a bit older um, okay so i'm excited excited for that one because it's one that i've had in the back of my head for ages it carries on in the same world and it picks up a couple of the characters from my last series as well so that's that's fun nice <laughs> and what's the title uh, that one's called Wrath of Hades. Wrath of Hades. Awesome. You just reminded me of one other question I meant to ask you during the interview, and then we probably should stop talking and let people get back to their <laughs> uh, regularly scheduled lives. Um, but you have uh, changed covers sometimes on your book, started with one and gone to another. I don't know if you've done it more than once. What is your feeling about um, how to know when to change and how to know whether or not the change actually helped increase uh, sales and conversions? Or have you ever had an experience where you're like, I'm not really sure that this is a better cover? This is actually a very timely conversation. So on my, uh, my Hercules series, I, um, just after I released the fourth book, I decided to change the covers because I think I was aiming at too much an urban fantasy market. Uh, and what I did before I changed the covers is I set up a split test on Facebook and I created uh, exactly the same text, blurb and link, but I used an image of the new covers on one ad and an image of the old covers on the other ad. And I ran that for around seven days and the new ads, a lot more people clicked on them, the clicks were much cheaper, the click through rate was much higher. So based on that, I thought, okay, well, the audience I'm targeting here on Facebook is high fantasy and they're taking on the new covers a lot better. So I changed the covers. I sent a newsletter out saying that I was going to leave the paperbacks for a month because I'd only just released the last book and I want to give the guys who bought the previous paperbacks a chance to get a matching set. So I will be changing the paperback uh, on all of them a, a month after. Um, my teenage series, uh, the Academy series, I've got these incredible illustrated covers done by uh, a Chinese company of illustrators. I love them. They were custom done. They're amazing. Um, but I hadn't intended to recover this series at all until next year. And then I was going to try and get the series into schools and libraries a little bit more. Um, however, I had all these beautiful illustrations done. So I was like, oh, I think I'll just use them in some Facebook ads anyway. And I had had the best response to these Facebook ads of any ads I've ever run. And I run a lot of advertising 
Um, so then I started to think, well, hold up. <laughs> I'm getting three or four times as many clicks on this illustrated picture than I am on the existing cover. So I figured that was telling me something. Yeah. <laughs> so I just changed the covers to the illustrated covers um, yesterday or the day before. Um, so I haven't had a chance yet to see if it's going to change the length of the book or anything. But um, again, I won't wait. I'll have to wait until the last one comes out and give the guys with the paperbacks a chance to get a matching set before I change the paperbacks as well. Yeah, that's a really nice thing to do for your readers. <laughs> so I do feel the same about the the paperbacks that I have. If if I'm going to get it, I want them all to be the same. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it sounds like the way that you, I, I hate to, I hate to say your advice because you might not mean it that way, but what you found to be working for you is that you did actually pay for the other cover, but then you tested it before you changed it just in case. Yeah. On the illustrated one. Yeah. Yeah. I made the original Academy covers myself to just fit with what was selling well in Academy at the time, but it's probably not the best match for the books, which are younger um, than possibly the old covers suggested. Yeah. Um, so I guess I've changed both series covers based on feedback, I suppose, in a general sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, um, the new covers combined with the last book being out has definitely helped. I think my my Hercules series. Yeah. Excellent. Wow, Kim, you are a font of information, which I appreciate <laughs> your willingness to share. <laughs> oh, it's really nice to be able to. Do something back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If there's any use. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it will be. I mean, people listening are in all different stages, you know. And then there's people like me that, on the one hand, I have eight titles out. On the other hand, um, the bottom floor of my life kind of gave way uh, a while back, and um, and all the writing kind of went away, got washed away by the tide. Um, so I'm actually in the interesting, but I'm I'm looking at it from a positive standpoint. I'm in the interesting place of basically restarting everything again. So I think it'll be fun for me to to start over with. Um, like looking at all the covers one more time, looking at all the blurbs one more time before I start making other kinds of like um, doing a lot of ads, like being able to yeah. do some testing first. So um, I think testing is so helpful. Yeah. Also, um, have you heard of Kayla Tips? Yes, I, um, I think that I have a membership there. Love their reports. I get their genre reports for the genres I'm interested in. And they're, I think they're, they're great for showing you what's doing well and predicting trends and really useful yeah excellent i think that right. one off reports are like 37 dollars which is um, really reasonable especially if you're really into spreadsheets and analytics like me <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's true i mean you have to there's a lot of things that you need to learn when you're getting into self-publishing um mm -hmm. because you're the boss of the whole company and if you don't know and you're not willing to learn then you've got to at least be able to be willing and have the money to hire somebody who does understand mm. it um, or maybe reconsider whether or not um, you would prefer to be traditionally published and not have to deal with all of the analytical stuff. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> or we can find out from your husband whether or not he's willing to hire himself out. <laughs> he practically is. <laughs> he could be one of those many, many authors. Uh, well, I should say... Um, there are so many authors that I've heard them interviewed on Mark Dawson's podcast where they've gotten their spouse, which a lot of times is the husband, to be a part of their business. And then a couple of times I've heard that, that that spouse has then been creating their own side business out of, you know, the yeah. analytical stuff or the ads or something like that. So it could happen. <laughs> it's, it is incredible. I didn't realize to the, the extent, the kind of micro economy around self-publishing. There's, it's just, it's amazing. There is just freelance work in almost every aspect of it. If you don't want to format, you can find someone who'll do it for $50. If you don't want to, I don't know, any of it, there's people who can help with everything. And yeah. oftentimes people will offer help for free as well if you're in a people. Um, it's, it's great. It's yeah. really, really good. And so One many great thing. people. Yeah. 
that I found recently that I absolutely love. And this is more on the writing side of it. I don't know if you've heard of it. And this might only appeal to more fantasy folk, but there's a website called forthewords.com. All the words? For the words. So for the, the number words. four. Oh, okay. And then for the words. And it's basically, you, you get a little character and you have to go on this quest through all these worlds, killing monsters, but you kill monsters with your word count. So to kill one monster, it might be 100 words in 15 minutes. To kill another monster, it might be 2,000 words in four hours. And the more monsters you kill, the more things you collect to complete different quests. And then the more quests you complete, you get like clothes for your character or pets or like hats or weapons and all sorts of stuff. And then you unlock other areas and new monsters to fight. And honestly, my word count's gone for the roof. So like, yeah. <laughs> my husband's like, do you want tea? And I'm like, no, I've got to kill this monster. Five hundred more words. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have always it's said great. that there are so many things that I either want to do, but don't quite get to it. Or I don't want to do like any, anywhere on the scale. Gamification will make me do it though, because yeah, I want to win. <laughs> The gym or step counters or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I got my step counter. <laughs> One time we were in Paris and we had walked 39,982 steps or something like that. Walk up and down. We were, so I walked up and down the hotel room <laughs> until I got to 40,000. And my oh husband's my like, you are nuts. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's 120 steps. I'll be done in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I took a picture of it because I'm like, my step counter is never going to say 40,000 again. <laughs> okay, oh, we have the words to link definitely that. for you. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to log in as soon as right. we hang up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it costs, it's a free trial, but then I think it's about two or three pounds a month. Completely oh, worth it for me. <laughs> totally worth it. All right, we definitely have to put that link in the show notes so everybody can know. <laughs> That's awesome. Cam, this is so much fun. I cannot wait to meet you in person in a few more weeks. Yeah, Yay. And then I can meet your awesome husband and be like, dude, that is so cool. Seriously, are you going to hire yourself <laughs> out? I could be your first client. <laughs> um, you know what? Seriously, he could do like those little free video classes that are like, these are the things you need to do. And then not, not actually have to do yeah. anything for anybody else just show you like a spreadsheet like this can make you be able to do this and track that see now i'm gonna to have to talk him into it <laughs> well, I've, built, I've built an analytics tool where he helped me with <gasps> an analytics tool and i've shared it with my friend that uh, we met last year to try and like tighten it up and hone it but i don't really know what to do with it now i built it i'm sure it can help other people but i've yet oh. to work out the best way to do something with it. well <laughs> we should talk about it when we meet <laughs> uh, particularly if we can gamify it <laughs> yeah that's the way <laughs> seriously you know that's another thing if there was some way i could get points for doing this the excel spreadsheet stuff that that normally i would love it's just if i'm thinking about writing excel is not what i want to do but there are days mm -hmm. when i'm like seriously john i i just want to work on the budget while i have netflix on he's like why and i'm like because it's fun but if yeah. I'm in my writing mode I'm like no I don't want to leave this so <laughs> <laughs> okay seriously I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking to you <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Kim tell us again where can listeners find you your books and whatever other uh presences that you have online or otherwise um so you can go to elizarain.com uh, you can type Eliza Rain into Audible or uh, Amazon in whatever area you're in. And if you're in the market for cozy mystery vector covers, you can go to uh, kimscozycovers.com and see my portfolio there. Okay. And just to be clear, Rain is R-A-I-N-E, right? Yes, it is. That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. And Eliza with a Z or a Z. I'm not sure yeah. if it's a Z or a Z to you. It's a Z for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and definitely I'm going to go check out your, uh, your cover design because that sounds fun for me too. <laughs> Kim, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. It's been quite fun. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really, really fun. And I hope, um, I hope that someone out there has found something useful and uh, been able to share. <laughs> <laughs> 